brothers. God bless you. Um, I had a question. I got a friend from New York that I've known for 35 years. I'm calling from Oregon. I live there. Um, but he's a Calvinist, and he he said a couple of things to me that really kind of shook me up, even though I've been a Christian a long time. He says he doesn't believe in free will, and he also mm -hmm. believes that everything has uh, been predetermined, every thought, word, deed, action of every human being, whether it's good or sinful or evil, is predetermined by God. So I just wanted to get your response on that. Yeah, I, I once had a Calvinist, uh, well, a Greek teacher. Well, I'll just go ahead and say it, my Greek teacher. Uh, actually happened to be Calvinist. And he said to me one day, he said, Jeff, you see that speck of dust floating around in the air and the sun shining onto it? And I said, yeah. And he said, that is there by the direct uh, control of God, speck of dust. And he said, if he's controlling that speck of dust, he's controlling everything. And that's what he believed. Now, he was a great Greek teacher, but I really parted ways with him on the Calvinism because one of the tenets of Calvinism, as you know, is um, the tenet of irresistible will, that um, nobody makes up their mind or decides according to their own will to come to Christ, but they are drawn by the irresistible pull of the grace of God. It's called irresistible grace. And so if somebody is saved, it was the grace of God that drew them. They had nothing to do with it. They didn't make up their mind or make a decision but God chose them before the foundation of the world, and being chosen, they had no hope of never not getting saved, but they were destined to be saved, and when the grace of God decided to act on them, then they irresistibly came to Him by the irresistible grace of God. Now, when you hear that, then you have to really consider some other verses. Uh, for instance, whosoever will let him come. Okay, that's the last chapter of the book of the Bible, last chapter in Revelation, whosoever will let him come. Uh, Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then again, it is not God's will that any would perish, but all would come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, if it's God's will that all would come to the knowledge of the truth, then shouldn't all then be drawn by the irresistible will of God. No, that verse is simply saying that God would love it if everyone would repent and come to Christ and be saved. But that's that's not going to happen. Uh, not everybody is going to repent. But the very word repentance, and you got to really just run this through common sense and logic. Repent requires an act of the will. How in the world can you repent if you don't will it? How can you repent if you don't decide it? How can repentance be separated from a decision of your will? Uh, otherwise, repentance is not repentance. How can somebody repent if their will is not involved and they're being drawn by the irresistible grace of God? Repentance requires a decision. It's just that simple. When uh, Peter was finished with his uh, very first sermon, uh, the day of Pentecost, uh, after the falling of the Holy Spirit upon the human race, in the upper room. They said to Peter, after listening to his convicting words, they said, what must we do to be saved? And he said, repent. Now notice, their question was, what must we do? Now he didn't say to them, well, you don't have anything to do with it. Uh, you're, if, if you're destined to be saved, you're going to be drawn by the irresistible will of God. So just, just go ahead and, uh, and be saved. But no, they said, what's our part? What must we do? What action do we take to be saved? And the first word out of his mouth was repent. Repent requires a decision. And so just a little bit of common sense and logic and tons of verses that refer to the will of a person and making a decision to follow Christ uh, are, are in the Bible, Old Testament and New. So um, based on that, Scott, I know you have some thoughts mm -hmm. about this. Um, jump in. Yeah, Jeff, I thought that was great, and I totally agree with you. And, you know, the first scripture that comes to my mind, of course, there are lots of scriptures in the New Testament who talk, that talk about whosoever will. 
that there is a choice we have to make. I know some people point to uh, scriptures like where Jesus said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. I would be very careful in using that in relation to salvation because he was literally speaking to his 12 disciples when he said that, and he did choose them. In fact, he prayed all night the night before, before he began choosing them. And so I would be careful in using that in any kind of salvific way. But what is interesting is Jesus did say, many are called, few are chosen. And what's that mean? Well, when you look at that and break it down, it means this, that everybody's called. The, the invitation to salvation goes out to everyone, but few are chosen. And that doesn't mean that God has only picked a few to be saved. What it means is few answer the call to prove themselves to be part of the chosen. And so there's God's part in salvation, which is sending the Holy Spirit to convict our heart of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and to draw us to the Father. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and salvation, listen, no one's getting saved, okay, <laughs> unless the Holy Spirit first comes to a sinner in his darkness and begins to draw him to the Lord. If that doesn't happen to any of us, we'll all end up lost. But that's God's work. Then our work then is to respond to his work of drawing us and convicting us uh, through faith in the gospel and through repentance. It's very clear. And there's one scripture that I think just really answers this so clear. It's First Peter or Second Peter chapter three, verse nine, where it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He says, But he's long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So right there, it tells you God's will is not to create some people just to be fodder for hell and create some people to go to heaven. No, he created all of us. He loves all of us. He's provided a salvation for all of us. First uh, John uh, chapter 2 actually says that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. There's another scripture that makes it clear that salvation is for everyone who will repent and believe. Uh, but, you know, there in, in 2 Peter 3, 9, it makes it clear that God's will is for all to be saved, but all are not going to be saved. That's clear as we read the rest of the Bible. Why? Because they are not willing. And, you know, Jeff, it kind of reminds me, too, of how when Jesus came the first time and when he came into Jerusalem for the final time, when he was going to give his life, and he looked over the city of Jerusalem and spoke to the Jewish people in, in speaking to the city of Jerusalem and said, you know, how I have longed to gather you under my wings, you know, like a, a hen gathers her chicks, mm -hmm. but you weren't willing. You missed the day of, of your visitation. So, you know, it's very interesting that, you know, God does his part, uh, but then our part is to respond to what he has done. And if we don't, then we're the ones that's going to suffer for eternity. Yeah, and why would Jesus upbraid people for not repenting. In other words, sure. uh, like he said uh, regarding Capernaum, uh, I think it was if, yeah. if, if Sodom and Gomorrah had had the miracles performed mm -hmm. uh, in, in their borders that you have Capernaum, uh, they would have repented long ago uh, and they would still be standing. Why, why in the world would Christ upbraid people for not repenting if it's all an act of God and there is no will? 